Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatoria. So when this appeared on my wall behind me up there, um, lots of you went crazy. Um, some people didn't know what it was. Some people immediately knew what it was. So what is it? Well, quite simply, it's a Southeast Asian, I'm gonna say, I'm not gonna be more specific than that for now, Chris. Now, these do sometimes go by other names and most Chris um, are dagger sized. Um, this is a Chris sword sized one a short sword at least. Um, it's about a 20, uh, it's over a 20 inch blade, it's fairly large and um, it's still pretty sharp. I don't know the precise age of it because Chris is actually quite difficult to date. Um, you can sort of get a, you can get an idea of their date based on the um, sort of wear and tear and the patina and things like this and uh, the, the general look of them, things like the wood, does the wood look old? This wood does look old, the brass does look old and the rattan binding on the grips does look fairly old. In terms of whether it's like early 20th century or mid 19th century, I just couldn't say. So I have to say straight up, um, straight off the bat, I am not in any way, shape or form an expert on um, Southeast Asian weapons. In fact, I'm not an expert on Asian weapons at all in general. My expertise very clearly is on European, mostly British weapons. But I do, however, know something about um, I was going to say Filipino weapons there. This isn't necessarily Filipino, but I, I know something about Filipino weapons and a little bit about Filipino martial arts because I have friends who do Filipino martial arts. And so anyone who does Kali, for example, um, or watches Forged in Fire and knows Doug Marcada and, and things like that and watches YouTube videos about um, martial arts in general, but obviously bladed martial arts, will see that the Chris sword is used in Filipino martial arts. But... It's not a weapon that is particular to the Philippines. You do find it in other countries of the area as well. The Chris you find in Java, Malaysia, and um, all, all around Southeast Asia, really. And its origin is, I won't say obscure, but um, it's rather interesting. It seems that the Chris, probably a more dagger-sized one, came about really quite a long, long time ago, at the same kind of time as the European Dark Ages. Um, and as a weapon, it seems to be one of the oldest weapons in the Philippines, for example. Um, you can see it in artwork uh, on uh, friezes and sculptures and things like this from a really very early date. And they were bef definitely in use, pretty much in a similar form to this. I should, I'll should i talk about the different forms in just a second. But pretty much in a similar form and size to this, they were in use by the uh, what in Europe would be called the Middle Ages, so by the kind of 15th century. Now, um, in terms of the form, this is a particularly wavy one. I have read that um, the wavy ones were partly uh, dress and showing off accoutrements, and that in war, people tended to use um, straighter ones or at least ones with less uh, less ripples in them, shall we say. And uh, that may or may not be the case, I don't know. I don't know enough about the culture, I don't know enough about the history to say whether that's the case, but that's something I've read anyway. I can sort of see that that might be true. Um, we can find parallels in other cultures where you have a fancy weapon for wearing in civilian life and perhaps a more simple utilitarian weapon for kind of battlefield use. Now. Something really important to say about this is if you look at um, modern Filipino martial arts, you may well get the impression that people in the Middle Ages in the Philippines or Indonesia or Java or these kind of places, Malaysia, these are the places used one of these, or uh, let's just say a sword or a big knife, um, sometimes or often with another sword or big knife. And indeed, there are some cultures, um, for example, if we look in Thailand, we know we've talked about the use of two um, dars together and things like this. And absolutely, there were some cultures that were using two weapons. However, if we look at the Philippines, it's very noticeable and very, very well documented from descriptive accounts, sculptures, art, um, freezes, uh, uh, have I said photographs already? Uh, photographs from the 19th century um, and, and basically it's very well documented that in fact this, much like in Europe for most of the Middle Ages, was normally a backup weapon to a spear and the spear was usually used with a shield. So the sort of headline, and I could go much deeper into this topic and I probably will do in the future when I myself have studied it a bit more, um, but if you look at the typical Filipino warrior of the 
15th to 17th or even 15th to 19th century, then their main weapon is usually a spear with a shield. So spear and shield is their primary fighting uh, kind of combo. And then the sword, whether it be a barong or a chris or um, some other type of knife that was used in that region at the time would be their backup weapon worn at the side. I am unfortunately lacking the scabbard for this. Um, if you google the Chris, K-R-I-S, you can find examples, you'll find in Google Images, you'll find examples of what the scabbards look like for these and they're pretty much predictable. They're a wooden, uh, a wooden section that goes along here and then a flared bit for the um, sort of guard as it were to slot into. Now this isn't my main video about the Chris or about Filipino weapons. I will do a bigger, better researched, more in-depth video at a later date. However, I couldn't not talk about this, so I'm going to talk about this from a personal point of view. Um, so not having known Kali or any Filipino martial arts, I've, you know, I've got some friends who've shown me a little bit and I've watched some DVDs of uh, Kali DVDs and stuff like this, so I know a little bit, but I've never trained in Filipino martial arts and I have to say that is not for a want of trying. I've actually looked in my area and even sort of kind of like up to about 10 miles around my area to try and find any teachers of Filipino martial arts and I can't find any. I'm not particularly interested personally in a screamer or the, the more competitive stick fighting side of it, Dog Brothers type stuff, but I'm very interested in traditional Kali um, and, and particularly the more unusual aspects or the less practiced aspects of, of Kali. But unfortunately, I can't find any teachers here. I know in the United States, there's t teachers everywhere, for, it seems to be, for Filipino martial arts. Unfortunately, it's not the case in Britain. Um, but anyway, from a personal point of view, uh, so I bought this sword um, in an antique auction with a bunch of other swords. Um, that we're going to go on my website to sell um, Eastern Antique Arms, link below. Um, and uh, quite simply, when this came to me, I was so overjoyed when it entered my hand. When I, when I gripped this weapon firmly, I was uh, like, I knew that I couldn't let this weapon go. It is absolutely gorgeous. It is such a lovely, lovely thing. Not only is it just beautiful to look at. I have got to be careful handling this incidentally because it is still quite sharp. But if I'd get my face out of frame, hopefully the camera will now focus on the weapon. So you can see the the absolutely beautiful construction of this weapon. Um, we've got alternating brass, rattan, brass, rattan, brass. Um, I don't know why there's a ring around there, but there is a ring around there. And this is some type of carved um, hardwood. Again, I'm having to be a little bit careful with handling this because it is still fairly sharp. Um, the, the way that the blade has been forged and ground and engraved or chiseled, I would say, actually, certainly this has been chiseled out, um, is just incredible. The work, the workmanship, whenever this was made, whether it's 20th century or 19th century, I, it, difficult for me to tell, um, but it's exceptionally well made. Incidentally, in terms of how they're made, the blade, this from here upwards is one piece of steel. There's a brass um, thing that kind of goes from the grip to there. So you've got two points of connection. You've got the tang going into the grip and then you've got a ring coming around here which binds the blade to there. And in the middle you've got a guard section and you probably can't see, but just there you can just see a line. So this piece of steel going along here and then with these indentations, which I'll talk about in a minute, is a separate piece of steel, just like a guard on, on a European sword. And then this is a wooden grip that's obviously wrapped in brass and rattan. Um, and these, as I understand it, are usually kind of glued on, or so I, someone told me um, that they sometimes put a hair around the tang, so it's kind of friction held on. But then you have, with these, got the additional uh, security of that brass band going across there. And the shape of this thing, it sits so nicely in the hand and it really wants to drop forward and chop. It, apart from that, let's just ignore the waviness for a minute. I'm, I've been asked for years to talk about flamberges and wavy blades. I, I'm gonna save that for a future video because it's a big topic. Um, but let's ignore the waviness. In terms of the blade, it's more or less straight, but it has, you'll notice it has a very slight drop 
in this direction, which I find very interesting because it means that you've actually, if it was straight, you've got a slight um, sort of almost a like cookery like or uh, almost like a Dacian falx um, concave chopping edge there and also means for thrusting it brings the because the hilt itself is um, it's actually fairly online this one some of them are a bit more tilted but it does mean that because you've got a slight curve in it there it's very natural for the for the thrust and the shape of the grip the way it has that kind of crook there for the little finger to sit into is really really comfortable now I did say I was going to talk about this guard I have read, and it seems completely plausible, that the reason for all of these little decorations on here, or seem like decorations, they're teeth, essentially, and they're quite sharp, and they've been um, filed in, I would presume. Um, and would they catch a blade coming up here? I think absolutely, yeah. I think they would absolutely bind against um, an opponent's blade that slides down here, and it's gonna prevent it from sliding off the guard. And any of you who fence out there, you'll know very often an opponent's blade does slide off the guard if you, if you have an unfortunate bind. But having these little teeth on the surface of that guard will really prevent that sliding off there. On the other side, we've got a little shape there that's often likened to either an elephant's trunk or I think an eagle's beak. And they apparently they tend to be either more like a beak or more like a trunk. It might have some religious meaning, I don't know, but it's also got the little teeth in it, um, just like you do on this side. So, But obviously that's on the downward side, so mostly things are going to be presumably coming on the upward side, or they expect it to be in the way that they use this weapon. Now, how did they use this weapon? Well, whilst you could certainly stab that into unarmoured people, in the Philippines, people were sometimes armoured. It's not a doesn't scream to me as a particularly thrust centric weapon. It seems to be more of a chop weapon. Um, but the thing that I really want to say is that if you look at modern Filipino martial arts, you might get the perception that these are often used alone or with a dagger or another one of these. Whereas we know historically they were predominantly used with a shield. And now, as I've spoken about in reference to the gladius and other types of sword, if you're using a sword with a shield, it very much dictates not only the design of that sword, but how that sword's used. And if you take a medieval arming sword, the way that you use a medi medieval arming sword by itself is reasonably different to how you use a medieval arming sword with a shield. Um, so um, I do know that there are some surviving indigenous uh, Filipino and other parts of Southeast Asia martial arts that do still use shields, but they don't seem to be very widely practiced in the West. They don't seem to have escaped Asia, but they do still survive. And there are some videos on YouTube of sword and shield stuff um, that looks very interesting and I want to look more into. So um, just to sum up my view of this weapon, I absolutely love it. It just screams effectiveness in your hand. It actually got, if you just shut your eyes so you can't see the thing when you're holding it, it does feel quite like either a small falchion or a, a lang massa or perhaps something like certain types of um, barong and machete that I've held. So it does feel like a chopper. Doesn't really feel like a thruster. Um, that doesn't always mean that that's how it was used, but it feels it's got a really powerful chop to it. It's quite a heavy blade. Um, it's also super sharp. Um, and just before I end, I'm going to make a, just one comment about the wavy blade. Do I think that the wavy blade adds to the sword's effectiveness? Well, we know that lots of these Chris swords didn't have wavy blades. Many of them actually had straight blades. So therefore, you could either say that, well, therefore, lots of the people making these swords obviously didn't think it was that important, or they wouldn't have made the ones with straight blades, they'd only make the ones with curvy blades. But the ones with curvy blades are definitely more difficult to make. It's more time consuming, a lot more work, um, a lot more skill, you could say, or at least a reasonable amount more skill, but a lot more time, definitely, and more difficult to sharpen. Uh, this one, I don't have to worry about that because it's already sharp, <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, definitely, I would say it takes more time to sharpen this type of blade than it does a straighter one. Um, does it make a more effective chopper? Simple answer is I don't know, um, but I have some theories, and again, I'm going to talk about that in a future video. 
but I do think having a curvy blade certainly is not going to make it worse at cutting. I suspect it will make it better at cutting certain things. Um, in terms of thrusting, I think usually it would make thrusting less effective, or reduce the penetration. You won't get such deep penetration. Um, but conversely, you'll get better push cuts and draw cuts. So um, if, you're, if you're slicing or pushing with the edge, it's going to be hugely more effective with this wavy edge because it's literally going to saw its way through the target um, or draw its way through a target more effectively than, um, than a straight blade will or even more effectively than a simple curved blade will. So um, I think there's a lot to be said about wavy blades and I will talk about them in the future. I do not, and this is what I, I'm just going to finish up on saying I think, I do not think that wavy blades are purely a gimmick at all. I do think partly they show status in terms of because they're more expensive to make because of time and you know experience and everything else. But I do think that they have qualities, martial qualities, practical qualities that a straighter blade or a simple curved blade doesn't have. So I do think that they have a genuine reason to be, um, not only to look awesome, but they do look pretty awesome. So there we go. This isn't the first wavy blade I've ever owned. I had a Chris, a dagger sized Chris once before. I sold it, which meant that I couldn't make videos very easily about wavy blades because I didn't have, I like to have something to hold when I'm making my videos, as you guys know. Um, and I will talk a little bit more about this sword Chris in the future, but man, it is just a lovely weapon. And no, I'm not going to be selling this. <laughs> Cheers, folks. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, follow us on Facebook. You can buy t shirts through Spreadshirt, support us on Patreon, or follow us on Pinterest. Thank you.